on this evening, and uh, I'm not sure how much I'll be riding on the board, but we've got an I need an usher. Where's one of my ushers? Come on, Scott. Scott will turn around and take up the Wednesday night offering for you. We're continuing to talk about hearing the voice of God, and uh, I'm going to uh, start out with this statement. Uh, it's a statement I made two weeks ago, but I want to make it again tonight. As we mature, we realize that the spirit realm is not something we step into and out of. Right. When we, if we're not real careful, we'll get the idea that when I'm at church and I feel the Holy Ghost goosebumps running up and down my back, and I feel the Holy Ghost hair standing up on my arm, or however it is that when you feel the wind of the glory starting to blow over you, that you respond. If we're not real careful, we'll get the idea that when I'm having that emotional response, I'm in the spirit. Right. And then on Monday when I wake up and it's 5 a.m. and I don't like the alarm clock very much at the moment. And it's cold outside and I've got to go to work and look at it a long week. And I just don't feel that spiritual wind blowing on me if we're not real careful. We get the idea that I was in the spirit on Sunday, but I wasn't in the spirit Monday morning. And I want to remind you, I say this quite often, your faith is not determined by your feelings. You are in the spirit because you are a spiritual being. That's right. right? You are, whether you are consciously aware of the moving of the spirit at that moment or not, the Holy Spirit does not wax and wane inside of you if right. you are filled with the Spirit. Right. If I'm filled with the Spirit on Sunday morning and the Lord moves upon me and I give a message in tongues and Mike jumps up and gives an interpretation, I am no more filled with the Holy Ghost in that moment than I am on Monday morning when I hit the alarm clock that third time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That's just that's that's real. You are filled, if you are filled with the Spirit, you are just as much filled on Sunday morning during that time as you are on Wednesday night. It's something that we have to learn to actively walk in, live in, and understand. The Holy Spirit is affecting my life 24-7, 365 if I let Him and I am aware of the fact that He's doing it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I'm not yeah. quenching him. I'm understanding that I'm being led by him. I'm right. not. I'm not rejecting him, and I'm not counting on my emotions to dictate whether or not I'm being led by the Spirit. Right. Yeah. Sometimes being led by the Spirit means being led by faith, contrary to your emotions. Mm -hmm. Right. Let me ask for a show of hands on this one. How many times has there been someone in here and you know you were led by the Spirit in a moment that was contrary to your emotions? Yeah. I myself been in situations where if I had to count on my emotions, I was in trouble. Yeah. Right. But my emotions were so turn, turned upside down, inside out, twisted every which way that if I had to count on my emotions to show me that I was being led by the Spirit, I would have been in trouble. But because I had a knowing down inside of me that I am saved by the blood of Jesus, I live by the name of Jesus, I walk in the power of the Holy Ghost, because I had that knowledge inside of me more than just an emotion, I realized that I walk, talk, live, think, act every day, react in the power of the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost dwells in me. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That, that's, I think, very important. Uh, oftentimes, we are waiting for God to show up, and He is waiting for us to grow up. Yeah. So many times, we're waiting for God to show up, and He's waiting for us to grow up. Mm -hmm. That means not being so swayed by my emotions as I am by my faith. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, so with that said, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about tonight does come with an emotional attachment. And I'm not telling you that the emotions are bad, but I'm just telling you, don't count on your emotions to always indicate to you when you are being led by the Spirit of God. So let's talk, uh, and John did a great job last week talking about the uh, power gifts of the Holy Ghost and the Father speaking to us through those power gifts of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to touch on just a couple of other things tonight, uh, moving pretty quickly. Uh, number one, ways God speaks to you, and one of the ways is he often, well, not often, he does occasionally speak to men in an audible voice. Right. 
In Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, I want you to notice something happened whenever God said that to Moses. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it says, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this, the audible voice of God, when you hear it, it is a voice that will penetrate your very being. No, that's for, sure. for those of you who would say, I, have, I believe I've heard the audible voice of God, you would say to me, it shook me to my core. Yeah. Now, there have been times when I would say to you, I heard the voice of God, but in reality what I heard was the audible voice of the Spirit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And oftentimes, you know, we'll use that phrase interchangeably. But listen, when I am that I am yeah. speaks to you audibly, it will shake you mm -hmm. to your core. You will know you have been spoken to. You will never, those are moments that you will never be the same. Oh, yeah. if, if you'll go back and look at the places in the, in the Bible where God audibly spoke to men, they had very common reactions. Yeah. They hid their face. They fell on their face. They fell on their back as if they were dead. They did. They always had a reaction. It is an absolute overwhelming thing whenever this, well, the voice of the Lord speaks to you audibly. Number two, second way, is that oftentimes the Lord will speak to us in dreams. Uh, Brother John did a great job of covering this last week. I'm just going to touch a couple of things on that. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. <coughs> And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. How many of you believe we're in the last days? Yeah. All right. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. This scripture tells me that it is, a, it is the plan and the will of God for us to dream God dreams. Yes. The dreams that come to us by the Holy Ghost. And John did a great job explaining this last week. Uh, he said that when we sleep, our outer man is resting, but our inner man is aware and open to the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. I believe that's how you explained that, wasn't it, last week, John? And uh, sometimes you may have a dream that seems bizarre and disjoint. Sometimes you may have dreams that are plain and easily understood, and other times you are going to have dreams that may need interpreted. Yeah. But with that said, let me remind you, not all dreams are from God. That's right. I know that's There's true. a lot of confusion out there in the world about dreams, and uh, we need to be very cautious with chasing after dreams. Remember in G uh, Genesis chapter 20, verse 3, Abimelech dreamed a dream, and he did not need an interpreter. I'll read that scripture to you. Genesis chapter 20 verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and plainly said to him, You are a dead man because of the woman you have taken. Abimelech had a dream that God was speaking to him. He didn't need a soul to interpret that. It was very plain, very straightforward, right to the point. You're a dead man. And so he returned Sarah back to Abraham the next morning. Yeah. Then in Daniel chapter 7 verse 2, Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, behold, four winds of the heavens strove upon the sea. But Daniel needed an interpretation. And I think we brought this out last week. Oftentimes, if you have a dream that you are not certain of, I'm going to use the same um, instruction that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for a tongue and interpretation. If you receive an interpretation, the next thing you're supposed to do is pray to interpret. Yes. I'll let you think about that for a second. Right. If you receive a tongue, the next thing you're supposed to do is not go, Woo! I'm glad that's over. I sure do hope Brother Jamie will stand up and interpret that pretty quick. Mm. If you give an interpreter a tongue, your job, the next thing you're supposed to do is you begin to pray to interpret. Now, if you think you have had a God dream and you do not have the answer, the first thing that you're supposed to do is pray that God will give you the interpretation of that dream, mm -hmm. not call 1-800-INTERPRET-MY-DREAM. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it's, there's so much of that out there in the world today. And listen, this dream interpretation thing is a, can be a shady area where occultic practices can enter in to what is intended to be a powerful thing in the Holy Ghost to bring in confusion. Yep. So be very, very cautious uh, when you're looking for dream interpretation. Remember, dreams are often more contrived, especially in the Old Testament. Dreams would be contrived by false prophets to control people. That's right. They would claim they had a dream, but it wasn't real. They would claim that they had dreamed a certain thing, and it was just a lie that they were using to create control. And so we keep that in mind. Use caution in the areas of dreams. I'm not going to tell you that God's not giving you a dream. God, that, and I read in the book of Joel, God desires to give you dreams. But have wisdom and knowledge with maturity in your spirit. And if God gives you a dream, do not call your Sunday school teacher, your pastor, or your deacon board first and ask them to interpret it unless you have spent some time in prayer asking God to show you what it means. That's right. right. Amen. That's, yep. That's just spiritual biblical maturity. Yep. Now, with that said, let me remind you this too. We all want to think that God's giving me a dream about some great future event. But sometimes God dreams will come to you about your past. It might be about your present, and it might be about your future. God may be bringing you a dream about something that you're carrying from your past that maybe you need to forgive. He may be bringing you a dream about something that happened in your past between you and somebody in your family. You don't know what it is, and he's bringing reconciliation. So not all God dreams are going to all be about tomorrow or the next day. They may be about the past. They may be about something currently going on in your present, and they might be about your future. Mm -hmm. That's the reason you're going to need to spend time praying in the Holy Ghost, asking the Father to give you an interpretation. Yep. Comments or questions on that? Okay, let me go back to my other statement because I got y'all looking at me cross-eyed. Sometimes we're waiting on God to show up. Sometimes he's waiting on us to grow up. And sometimes, and this is just a method of growing and being mature as understanding the things that are going on with us. Pray for the interpretation and wait for it to come. Now, I'm going to give you this as my personal opinion. Chad Duvall's personal opinion right here. Everybody hear that, right? I want to make sure you know it's my personal opinion. Beware of professional dream interpreters. Oh, and here's my opinion about professional dream interpreters. Yeah. Anytime you try to do a spiritual thing in the flesh, it's always a recipe for deception. Oh, yeah. Right. Amen. Anytime you are attempting to do a spiritual thing through fleshly means, it is a possible recipe for deception. Oh, if yeah. you're coming to me with a spiritual dream, and I say, wow, water always means people, and wind always means the Holy Ghost, and rain always means something else, and a butterfly always means this, and, and I've got a book, and you say butterfly, so I turn to butterfly, and you say centipede, so I turn to centipede. What have I done? I have, I have taken dream interpretation into the realm of the flesh and saying that everything that I'm dreaming in my mind has to fit a pattern of flesh. But remember, God is not flesh, he is spirit. Right. And he operates in the spirit, through the spirit, by the spirit, and of the spirit. It is the enemy that operates in the flesh, of the flesh, through the flesh, and by the flesh. And so, remember, you cannot do a spiritual thing in the flesh effectively. Right. Amen. It's a recipe for error. Right. Yeah. Comment your questions on that? Well, brother... Yes. God told, uh, Daniel told somebody that wanted him to interpret a dream. He said, it's not in me to interpret it, but it's in God to give the interpretation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he prayed about it and got the interpretation, but it was with much prayer. Yep. Yeah. Bill. Do you think sometimes people worry, make a big deal about dreams, and there's really nothing to make a big deal over? Sometimes I think people make too big a deal over dreams. And this is, I'm going to give you another personal opinion of Chad Duval, Okay. If you have a God dream, how many of you in this room can say to me at some point in time, I have had some crazy dreams? Oh, yeah. Well, everybody in that room, your hand just went up. <laughs> we, we have crazy dreams. You know, you're driving a car underwater, you know, or something crazy like that. But the times in my life when I know I had a God-given dream, 
They do not leave me. I remember them in great vivid detail, and sometimes they come multiple times. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, Christy and I was talking about this the other day, and I was telling her about a dream that God gave me. I think I was 10 years old, and I can still tell you where I was at when I had the dream. I can tell you how the, the color of the room I was in, what bed I was sleeping in. I can tell you exactly in great detail down to the color of the things that were in the dream, yeah. but I know what the interpretation was. Mm -hmm. But that was when I was probably 10 years old when I had that dream. And I can still remember it in that vivid of a detail. I know that was a God dream. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, if you had, and I'm not going to say to you that all God dreams are going to, you're going to remember them forever and ever and ever and ever. But I will tell you that if most of the time, if you are having a spirit empowered dream, what good is it for the Lord to give you a dream? And then in 30 minutes after you wake up, you don't even remember it. Right. <laughs> How do you even that interpretation, Scott? All right, is it wise to do, to take Joseph's, uh, taking his dream to his brothers? Do we need to be cautious about sharing our dreams? Uh -huh. Yes. It can actually get us in trouble. Yes. yes, it can. Yes, it can. And my, boy, and we're talking about spiritual mature stuff tonight, right? We're gonna, remember, I just said a while ago, sometimes we're waiting on God to show up, God's waiting on us to grow up, so let's just say stuff that'll grow us up tonight. I think that some, oftentimes we are way too quick to throw our spiritual pearls on the ground before swine. Yeah, that's true. I think so many times, God, if God is speaking to me, I don't need to run and stand on the top of the tallest hill the instant I heard something from him and scream it at the bladder at the top of my lungs. I want to use Sister Yvonne as an example. Almost two years ago, she saw a vision of a girl in a pink shirt coming into the church in a wheelchair and being healed and walking out of the church with a wheelchair. How many of you even knew that it happened before the girl showed up? Nobody. And the reason you didn't know it happened is because when Jump when your mom received that from the Lord, she didn't go out and stand on the top, the top of the tallest hill and proclaim, thus saith the Lord, God told me this vision. And uh, she didn't do that. What did she do? She's filed that in her spiritual file cabinet and she prayed about it and she interceded over it and she sought for it because she knew it was a vision from God. Right. But she didn't right. run around spreading that spiritual corn on the ground. Right. Right. Sometimes it's right to tell. But I want to tell you, sometimes in spiritual maturity, well, am I being too hard tonight? No. 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 Sometimes in spiritual maturity, the right thing to do is hold it within myself and stay on my face before God and pray and weep over it myself until I get a release to share it. Amen. Right. Right. Amen. Right. Amen. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, the timing will be right. We proved that. Many meeting now, haven't we? Yes, we have. The timing's got to be right. Yes. Right. You know, the, the question was posed a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago. Can you get ahead of God? Yes, you can. Can you move too fast for God? And I'm going to say to you the answer is yes. There's a time and a season for everything. Brother Chad, you think about Mary. She didn't go around telling anybody she was going to have a child of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. She wasn't supposed to do that. She was the Virgin Mary. Yeah, yeah. She didn't stand up on the top of the hill and say, "Hey guys, guess what was happening last night?" Because, because she was not married to Joseph, right? Yeah, she would have been stoned to death, right? Yeah, if, if she'd have got ahead of God, and yeah, she didn't. She definitely didn't I run mean, that. They yeah, right. her magazine and put that out there, didn't she? No, that's right. Not at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. So just be careful with trying to do a spiritual thing in the flesh. Right. Just be cautious with that. Uh, the next thing, another way that God will speak to you is very similar to dreams and visions. I'll go back to that Acts 2.17 scripture. Not only to say when the old men dream dreams, but he also said young men shall see visions. A vision and a dream is very similar. There are open visions and there are closed visions. Yes. An open vision is a vision that if I were to be standing here right this minute, and I were to see an angel walk through that back door, but nobody else in the room can see it. But I'm awake, aware with my eyes open. That's an open vision. Mm -hmm. right. Okay? If I am in prayer and have my eyes closed, my head down, and I begin to see things in the spirit realm internally to me, that's a closed vision. 
There's open visions and there's closed visions. Both of those are scriptural. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1 and 2, I'll give you an example. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of dry bones. But Ezekiel wasn't actually really standing physically in a valley, and he wasn't actually physically surrounded by dry bones. He was in the spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? When John was on the Isle of Patmos, he said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. John didn't actually physically on that island see all those things in the physical realm. He was seeing those things in, as an internal vision, a closed vision. We also know that, in, that uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 10 through 16, you can go read the vision that Peter had. It says Peter was on the roof. He had, he had not eaten. He was up there praying. And he saw a, a, a sheep being let down from heaven that had multitudes of unclean beasts in it. It was opened up. The, the voice of the Lord said to him, take and eat. He said, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. He heard it three times. And at that point, the vision disappears and the Gentiles are knocking on the front door. And he realizes from that that he's supposed to go take the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, that again was an internal vision. Am I too loud? Turn it out, Mr. Jamie. <laughs> and uh, the last one I want to talk about, well, not necessarily the last, but in this line, uh, I want to talk about an unctions. Yeah. How many of you think you would say, I have had an unction of the Holy Ghost? Oh, yeah. Okay. What are unctions? An unction is a strong idea or desire to do something that you cannot explain. Mm -hmm. It sticks in your gut and will not go away. Oh, yeah. You get an unction, it gets in there, and it just stays and stays and turns and turns and turns. Unctions do not always make sense. Unctions are often a way of the Spirit leading us by faith. Sometimes you just follow and see what the end will be. Mm -hmm. You know, you've all heard examples. Uh, I can remember my mom saying several times when she was on the bell route, she'd be driving down the road, she'd receive an unction of the Holy Ghost to just pull over and stop. And within 10 seconds or something, a, a diesel truck would come around the curve on a blind curve on the wrong side of the road. What was that? That was an unction. How did she know to follow it? Well, she knew the voice of the Holy Ghost because she had spent time with the Holy Ghost. And because she had spent time with him, she had faith in the sound of his voice. And when he said stop, she stopped, even though she didn't understand why. You you'll, you'll, you'll oftentimes hear somebody say, I felt like I was supposed to go to Walmart and park in the third row. So I went to Walmart, parked in the third row, and then there's some kind of divine God moment where they bump into somebody that maybe they hadn't seen in a long time or whatever. You hear those stories. Those are functions of the Holy Ghost. And those are ways that the Lord does speak to us when we have that. Again, it's a strong idea or desire to do something which cannot be explained. And we call those functions. How many of you can say, I have definitely had an unction of the Holy Ghost? Several times. Yeah. I have, and uh, that's probably, I'm going to guess uh, that it's probably the most popular way people say to me that the Lord is talking to them or directing them. 99% of the time they're talking about they got an unction, mm -hmm. a strong desire to go do something that doesn't necessarily make sense. Now, go ahead, Bob. Can I tell a story about that real fast? Yeah, you sure can. <clears throat> Yeah, so for two years she had an unction to do that, mm -hmm. just a desire she couldn't get away from. And a lot of people will come to me and say, how do I know if it's God? How do I know if it's God? And, it's, and this oftentimes, you've heard me use this example before, is one of the ways that I do it myself. If I'm sitting there and in my recliner in my house and I decide I'm going to, you know, the thought runs through my mind, ooh, ice cream. I let the leg down on my recliner, I jump up and I run in the kitchen and I fix my bowl and sell a bowl of ice cream. And do you know I never hear my head say, that's just you, that's just you, that's just you. 
<laughs> Not one time. I can go get ice cream seven nights in a row, and my head never says, that's just you thinking that. But I can hear and get an unction inside of me that says, you know what, your neighbor's down. Why don't you go over and visit with them? They're lonely. And my head will scream, that's just you, that's just you, that's just you. Because here's what I've discovered. The flesh is at enmity with the spirit, and the spirit is at enmity with the flesh. Mm -hmm. And when it's the spirit talking to me through unction, my flesh will rise up and say, no, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Yeah. My flesh will inflame the desires of the flesh for me to go do the things of the flesh. But like my dad just gave this example, that lady said, it took me two years. I had an unction to do this ministry, but it took me two years to convince myself that it was the voice of God and stop listening to the voice that's saying, that's just you, don't do it. Right. right. So that, that's not necessarily the only test you need to use, whether the unction that you're feeling is of the Holy Ghost or not, but it is a good one if your head is fighting it. Now, I said something in that when I was giving the example with my mother that I want to go back and point out. I said this, my mother was comfortable enough with the voice of the Holy Ghost because of spending time with him mm -hmm. that he, she understood what the unction was. And you'll say, how do I spend time with the Holy Ghost? My very, very best answer is this, get filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and learn to use your heavenly prayer language in your private prayer closet. The more you speak in tongues, the more you will become accustomed to hearing the voice of the Holy Ghost inside of you. Right. When I am praying in tongues, it is the voice of the Holy Ghost in me that is coming out of me. It is, a, it is the language of heaven coming from in me to heaven, from heaven into me, back out of me. It becomes a will within a will. Out of me into heaven, out of heaven into me, out of me back into heaven. And the more time I spend in the presence of the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues and, and doing that in my prayer closet, the more accustomed I will become to hearing the voice of the Spirit and the more accustomed I will become to understanding if the unction is from the Spirit or if it's just from me. Right. Right. The more relationship I build with my King, the more I will hear and know His voice. And listen to this part. I will also, the more I will know His personality. Right. Right. If my if I get a phone call five minutes from now, somebody I don't know, and they say, Belinda wants you to stop and pick her up a mayonnaise and tomato sandwich on your way home, I'm going to laugh. My wife will not put mayonnaise in her mouth. <laughs> How would I know that it was the voice of a shyster trying to convince me to do something that I would sh shouldn't do? Because I know my wife, because I've spent enough time with her, that I know her personality. And so I would not do that. And we need to be that way with our king. We need to have spent so much time with my king that if a voice comes to me, even if it sounds like his voice, but it's speaking to me about something contrary to his word or his personality, that I know to reject. Amen. That's right. But at the same time, I've spent so, you know, spent so much time with him that I also know. Now, if she called and said chocolate drop cookies, I know that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> that would be her voice, but not the man I was to make a sandwich. So, yes. Well, Chad, when we get that unction, our spirit churns within us. It's like his words, like a fire that's shut up in our bones. And we know that the Bible says that the spirit quickened and that the words of Jesus speaks to us, our spirit, and our life. So we'll know that it's the Lord when, a, when the spirit and the life stirs up within our spirit, man. When we, we know it's yes, God the spirit and the life combining within us. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now, there's a difference between an unction and an impression. Yes. So let me tell you about the difference between an unction and an impression. An impression will pass quickly. Mm -hmm. How many of you would say with honesty in this room, you know, at some point I've been in a, in a service and I got the impression to give a tongue, but I didn't give it and it left and somebody else did it. Mm -hmm. Or I thought I had the interpretation, but I wasn't sure if it was me or the flesh. Mm -hmm. Go back and see what I said just a second ago about discerning that. And then all of a sudden somebody else did it and it left me. Or you might say, I felt like I was supposed to uh, go over and give Sister Mandy $20. 
for something in the children's church and uh, I held on to it for a minute and it just left. I don't feel that anymore. Those are impressions. Unctions will stay with you mm -hmm. and impression will pass if it's not fulfilled. These are gentle nudges of the Holy Ghost, but when the moment passes, they come and go. And a lot of times it will be, um, you know, maybe to, to give somebody, a, you know, uh, help somebody with, with some money. Mm -hmm. Or maybe uh, to give the tongue or the interpretation, something along those lines. But if unctions will stay with you, impressions will pass with time. Mm -hmm. Now remember, these can also be easily manipulated by your knowledge and your emotions. Mm -hmm. Impressions will often, often be manipulated by what I know and by my emotions. I may, if I know, let's say Mike is in a really bad financial situation and I feel compassion for Mike, mm -hmm. I may, because of my knowledge, pour, give Mike some money to help Mike out because of his bad financial situation. Mm -hmm. And But that may not be an impression from the Holy Ghost. That may have just come from my knowledge or my own emotions. So we need to be cautious that, and just remember, yeah. sometimes your fleshly knowledge and your emotions may be speaking to you to do something that's good, but it may not be the voice of God. Right. right. Amen. Yep. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Not always. And, and, and I'm going to throw this out. Again, we're talking mature stuff tonight. So I want to throw this out there. It is my personal Chad Duval opinion. Boy, I'm giving you a lot of that tonight, and most time I steer away from that. But my personal <laughs> Chad Duval opinion that taking the Lord's name in vain has far less to do with using four-letter words attached to the word God than it has to do with people who say, God told me, God told me, God told me, right. and they're running around doing stuff saying God told them to do it, but it wasn't the word God, then it was their box of Cheerios. That's right. That's good. Amen. Yeah. That's good. When I start attributing the word God said or God told me to what I wanted to do by my knowledge and emotions, I believe that's taking the Lord's name in vain. Amen. Now, I'll give you this as an example. This person is not in the area anymore, so you wouldn't know who I'm talking about. But at one point, many, many years ago, there was an individual who came to me, was talking to me, and said, I really feel like the Lord's impressing upon me that I need to leave this place that I'm living in and move into this place that I'm living in. Will you please help me pray? So I prayed about it and got a check in my spirit about it. Mm -hmm. Called him up on the phone and said, I think this is a really, really bad idea. Don't do this. I, I really have a check in my spirit. You asked me to pray about it and I've done it. And what they said to me is, well, I know God spoke to me and I don't think you're right. You're, you're telling me contrary to what God told me. So I'm moving anyway. And they did. And within about three months, they were bankrupt because they couldn't afford the payments where they went. And you know, that's one of those times when we have to be very, very careful because it's what we wanted yeah. or it's what our emotions right. were attached to. Yeah. And we begin to say, God told me, yeah. and it really is just what I wanted. Yeah. That is taking the name of the Lord in vain. We need to be very, very careful of that. We need to learn how to, to discern, is it my emotions and my knowledge or is it the voice of God? The way you're going to do that is spend more time with him. Yep. Yeah. Right. Build that into a relationship. Comments, questions on that? Bob? If we think we've heard the voice of the Lord, and we, is it wrong to question Him? Say, hey, I, I don't understand. Talk to me again. It is not wrong. It is not wrong. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, let everything be done by two or three witnesses. That's right. Yes. And I'm going to throw this out there since we're being very mature tonight. If this isn't one of the witnesses, you need to move away from it. That's right. That's right. Everything the Spirit directs you into is going to be able to be verified in this book yep. in some way or fashion. So this, everything by two or three witnesses, and if this isn't one of the witnesses, move away from it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, with what he just said, let me move into the next one. Another way you're going to know that the Lord is going to be able to speak to you is through peace and joy. Yep. Isaiah chapter 55 Isaiah chapter 55, verse 12. And you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, you all know that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. 
Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men. Matthew chapter 10, verse 13. The best one uh, going along this line. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. And if it is not worthy, let your peace return unto you. Yep. Oftentimes, if I'm in a situation and I want to know for sure if the Lord's leading me in that direction, speaking to me, I will be able to look for my peace and my joy, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. Mm -hmm. right. Occasionally, the voice of the Lord leads me into things that are uncomfortable in my flesh. But they are very comfortable in my spirit. Yeah. They are bitter in the on the tongue of my flesh, but they are joy in my spirit. I will just use this as a prime example. If the Lord ever has instructed you to fast for two or three days, it was bitter to your tongue, but it was satisfying and peaceful to your spirit. Right. <laughs> And so uh, look for peace and joy, not of the flesh, but of the spirit, to judge a direction, a voice, an unction, an impression, all those other things, to be careful and make sure you are following peace. It may be a word that disquiets my flesh, but it will be a, the word of the Lord if I have relationship through the Holy Ghost with the Lord Jesus Christ. If I hear his voice, his voice will not destroy peace within me. It will not bring confusion. It will not bring uh, fear, anything like that. It will settle in my belly as a peaceful joy. Yeah, right. Amen. Even if it says to me, do this or that, and the this or that is uncomfortable to the flesh, but it will cause peace in here, even if it doesn't cause peace in here. Mm -hmm. Amen. So I'm going to follow peace. Yeah. And sometimes, and I'm just, again, we're talking about maturity tonight. Sometimes I need to cool my jets and slow down long enough to test to see if it's peace or not. Yeah. Right. Again, every single thing I hear from the Father doesn't, now sometimes there's an urgency, but we're going to talk about urgencies mm -hmm. here in a minute. Sometimes there is an urgency, but most of the time when the Lord speaks to me, the Lord is, y'all all know that the Lord knows today, tomorrow, and yesterday. Yeah. And the Lord is not, going, is not surprised by the fact that three days from now, somebody may need my help. And so it's not beyond him to begin to speak to me about helping someone today when it's not for three days from now. And that means I need to begin to pray to him and ask a good, appropriate questions. Father, who are you sending me to? Where am I going to go? What's, it's not wrong to begin to pray for uh, to fill in the gaps of what you don't know. As a matter of fact, one of the most important things you can do when you're trying to hear the voice of the Father is learn to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. Learn to ask the right questions. That is a it's spiritual maturity when you've heard from the voice of the Father to hear, hear him and then step back and say, what are the questions I need to ask now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How much questions on that? Somebody that's been there and done that want to... Yes, sir? How do you know the difference? Difference in good questions and bad questions? Like seeing, like, uh, like what you were talking about, um, the difference between here... Uh, oh, sorry, I'm not... That's all right. Like say, like when, you're, when you say going down a road and you hear... And, and, and you hear that unction voice. voice. Yeah. Yeah, how do I know if it's <laughs> of the spirit or of the flesh? Right. Number, the, the first way, number one, is going to be build relationship. You know, if, uh, if, the, if your best friend calls you on the phone, they don't even have to say, hey, this is Jim. No. You just know it's Jim. Right. Um, so I begin to build that relationship with the Father. The more time I spend with him, the more time I spend in prayer, reading his word, uh, then follow peace. Mm -hmm. If it brings me fear, if it brings me confusion, if it brings chaos, then it's never going to be the Father. Right. And, right. and sometimes... Um, and I'm just going to, again, we're talking very mature tonight. I have learned more in my failures than I have in my successes. And so you're, never, you're not going to get it right every single time. And in the times you miss it, then you step back and say, Father, I missed that, but I learned something today. I'll never make that exact same mistake again. So be sensitive to the Spirit. Listen. Build a relationship with Him. Follow peace. And then do the best you can. And if you make a mistake, you just say, Lord, I messed that up. 
Teach me out of that and you just keep on going. Mm -hmm. And you learn from your mistakes as much as you do from your, if not more, than you learn from your successes. Mm -hmm. uh, this also, uh, the peace and joy also goes with your heart's, heart desires. And I think this is going to be a very, uh, maybe a very uh, mature educational thing for all of us tonight. How many of you have know what a heart desire is? Yeah. Yeah, something that's really down deep inside of you, a heart's desire. Psalms chapter 37 verse 4 says this. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Mm -hmm. And we've read that, and we thought, wow, this scripture says the Lord will give me the desires of my heart. I want a bright yellow Mustang convertible <laughs> GT or whatever your favorite car is. And we read that and thought, wow, if I delight myself with the Lord, I'm going to have the best bass boats, the best house. I'm going to have the best shotguns because those are the desires of my heart. But I want to switch your thinking here just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I believe this scripture actually says not that he'll give you what you want, but he will plant your in your heart desires that he wants you to have. Right. Amen. Right. This scripture says, if I will delight myself in the Lord, that means I spend, you know, if I delight myself in my wife, you know what that means? I want to be where she is doing what she's doing while she's doing it. Right. Not getting away. <laughs> Only has one male amen and no women amen. That really surprised me. <laughs> right there, I just. We were listening. You were listening to see where the rest of that story went, right? And so if my, if my heart's desire is to my wife, I will want to be with her, around her, doing things with her. Her desires will become my desires just because I enjoy being with her. Now, Amen. with, there you go, all right. That gets a little better. So now, if I have a heart desire from the Father, what that means is he drops inside of me something that's really, really important to him. And it becomes a hunger in me. And I find myself wanting to immerse myself in him because of his heart's desire that's now in me. Yeah. Right. I don't know if any of you have ever been an intercessor. But this happens to intercessors quite often. You'll be rocking on in your life, and the next thing you know, something becomes so intense inside of you. It's this heart desire, whether it's, let's say it's praying for the lost, because we've been praying for a thousand souls to be saved. And what I find is it's always on my mind. Every time I get down to pray, I try to pray for all the people on the list, and I find myself weeping for the lost. And I re-engage and try to pray for something else, and I find myself weeping for the lost. And I find myself continually seeking after them and, and praying about them, driving up and down the road, driving by people's homes, and praying over the people in those houses. What happened to me? Two weeks ago, I never even thought about the lost. What happened? I delighted myself in the Lord, and he spoke to me by dropping his desire in me. And his desire becomes a fire shut up in my bones, down in my belly, making me something I've never been before. Right. Amen. Amen. That, and that is a way of God speaking to you. <laughs> it's happened to me in my own life multiple times. Uh, I can give you great examples. Uh, we know Matthew 13, 3 says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. When the sower went out to sow, you all know this, he threw corn on the ground or seed on the ground, and some of that seed became 30, 60, 100-fold fruit. That seed that did that was the seed that went into good soil. One aspect of that good soil is this. Those were hearts that were delighted in the Lord and they accepted the seed of God into their good soil heart and God's desire became their desire and they produced 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. Why? Because God was inflaming that desire within them and it activated them into a work that God wanted done. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. If I continually chase my desires, it's real hard to stay in God's will. But when I receive his heart desire within me, it gets hard to get out of his will. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Because it inflames me to produce him. Abba is continually sowing seeds in us that we need to protect and nurture and pursue so the fruit of his will will be born in our life. Now, I'm going to throw this out there to you. How do you inflame a heart desire? 
This is a Chad Duval ism. Exposure increases appetite. Mm -hmm. Exposure increases appetite. If my wife says to me, I love going to yard sales, will you please take me to a yard sale this weekend? And because I have her heart desire within me to spend time with her, I get up early, whether I enjoy it or not, and I take her to a yard sale. And I stand there while she does what she does at the yard sale, and then I take her to the next one, and I just enjoy the time with her. If I do that long enough, you know what I'm going to find out? Yeah. I like going to yard sales. <laughs> and then I'm going to be finding out I jump out of the car just as fast as she does and run up there to see what I can get before somebody else snatches it up. Y'all are all laughing because you know how it works, right? Yeah. And, but what happened? Because I had a heart desire that was attached to the heart desire of my wife, and I began to keep myself exposed to that heart desire, the exposure increased the appetite within me. So if God has given me a heart desire, if I will then begin to immerse myself in it, exposure will increase appetite until I find myself openly consumed by the fire of God in me, pushing me to his will. Yep. Yes. Right. Exposure yep. increasing appetite. Mm -hmm. That's pursuing the uh, heart's desire. What time is it? Somebody help me. Oh, I got three minutes. Voice of authority. <laughs> Let me hear voice of authority. The Holy Ghost speaking to you through an authority in your life. Now listen, be, you also have to be careful with this. Is the Holy Ghost speaking to you through an authority in your life? It should be a voice of agreement or confirmation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Brother John will be the first to tell you this. I, myself, Sister Christy, if I ever come to you and say, the Lord told me to tell you this, that, or the other thing. If it is not a voice, uh, a word confirming something you've already heard from God, if it's the first time you've ever heard that, you put it in a Holy Ghost box with a Holy Ghost bow on it, and you put it on the spiritual shelf inside your heart, and you wait for confirmation. Amen. Amen. A voice of a prophet should be a voice of confirmation right. to you, especially if it's telling you to sell your house and move to China. Oh, okay. Yeah, if, I, if all it's telling you, if it's telling you to go home, be nice to your wife. Listen to that one. But if it's telling you something, you know, uh, that's out there a little bit, it ought to be a voice of confirmation. Uh, and I'm going to throw this out there. It must be in line with the Word of God. It must follow peace, and it must stand up to time and prophetic judgment. Yes. Yeah. Right. Hear that. If I'm getting the voice from a person of authority in my life, it must be in line with the word of God. It must follow peace within me. If, if Sister Christie comes up and gives you a word tomorrow night and it doesn't set in your belly well and it doesn't create peace within you and joy, again, put it on a shelf. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay? So it should be in line with the word of God. It should follow peace. And these two, it should stand up to the test of time and prophetic judgment. Mm -hmm. It's got to be able to stand the test of time. And, and I'm getting a tiny bit ahead of myself, but I'll throw this out there anyway because I don't think I'm going to get to it tonight. If anything that comes to you that says it is a voice of God or a voice of the Spirit in any way, and it is using a used car salesman technique of pressure, Get away from it. Yeah. Right. That's right. The Holy Ghost doesn't operate like this. Right. You got 35 seconds, 36 seconds, 34, 33, 32, 30. Pick up that phone, make that phone call. This deal will be off the table in 27 more seconds. If you don't call in the next 28 seconds, you're going to lose it forever and you'll never get it back. It will be gone. Last chance deal. That's not the Holy Ghost. Yeah. If it's a high pressure sales tactic, it is the devil. Yeah. yeah, He is trying to press you. Abba will never ask you to disengage your common sense to follow his voice. Right. right. Yeah. And high pressure sales techniques are asking you to disengage your common sense in an effort to beat a ticking clock. That's a pressure technique. If a voice of authority in your life is, pre is pressuring you, high pressure sales technique kind of stuff, do not listen. You need to be very careful with that. Be diligent with your caution in following the voice of any other person. Mm -hmm. 
especially if they are new to you or of an unknown origin. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If a person of authority, if they are a new person to you or they are unknown to you, I don't care if they're wearing a crown that's six foot tall and wearing a robe across their back that says King of Egypt, whatever. And they walk up to you and they're trying to speak into you and you do not know them. You don't know their history. You don't know their spiritual background. And they try to give you a word. You nod your head. You say, thank you very much. You put it in a spiritual box. You tie a bow on it and you put it on a shelf. Mm -hmm. if, you do, if they cannot pass the test of time and spiritual judgment, give it time anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's spiritual maturity. Yeah. To, to, to make sure, because the enemy wants to push you, push you, push you into something way too quickly. The last one I want to cover tonight is the last way, that, not the last, but one of the last ones I'll talk about uh, that the Lord's going to speak to you is right here. Oh, yeah. The word of the Lord. Yeah. When the Logos becomes Rhema. Now, this, I want to talk about this in more than just opening it and reading it like a newspaper. When the Logos becomes Rhema, that's that aha. Yeah. How many of you have ever been reading and something all of a sudden opens up to you like something just got unzipped? Oh, yeah. We call them, around here, I call them spiritual downloads. You're reading something and all of a sudden, whoa, I understand what that means. It's just a spiritual download dumped into you all of a sudden. That's that aha moment where the logos becomes the rhema in your life. These always increase my intimacy. Oh, yeah. When I get a spiritual download, it's as if the Father has pulled me over to the side and said, let me tell you a secret. Yeah. And it's like he's speaking straight to me all of a sudden. It's like he's whispering to me those, those sweet nothings in, off in the corner somewhere. It is a treasure, a pearl of great price. And uh, the meditating on the scripture is so important to get there. you got to dwell and look into the perfect law of liberty. Spend time with it. Meditate upon it. Keep it in your heart. Hide it within you. And if you do that, you will have those aha moments. Right. Here's your caution. You can never have an aha moment if you don't pick it up and read it. That's true. That's true. You can't have an aha moment. If, if all you're doing is sliding under your pillow and sleeping on it, I'll give I'll tell you this from, from teacher experience. I have had students for I had students for 12 years try to sleep on algebra books and it don't work. It just does not absorb through the skull. You're gonna have to open it and read it, sleep it on top of it, don't do you much good. Yeah, yeah. Everybody's tried that themselves, right? But uh, open it, get it in you. If you get it in you and you meditate on it and you keep it before your face. Abba will speak to you intimately in aha moments where the word opens up to you and you'll go, I get it. I get it. And it'll be a lot to you when that happens. Any other comments or questions? Scott. Uh, the Jewish, especially the Messianic Jews, say that there's four to five different depths of scripture. So what you're saying right mm -hmm. there is you are digging and scratched and dug and tried to find and you took that and found as you say, peeled the onion to the next level. To get right. Deeper to where he spoke to you to reveal it. Yeah, the more you, he says, seek and you shall find, knock, and it will be opened. I, so when I'm in this book and I'm digging and I'm reading and I'm chasing and I'm pursuing and I'm questioning, I'm asking and I'm knocking. And I, if I ask and I seek, I will find. He will open. Brother Dawson says, in thy light shall we see light. He'll show us light, but if we search within that light, there is even deeper revelation in right. what he shows. And that's the reason the Bible's called a living manuscript. It's a right. living book. Because you can, you know, I'll just pick Ephesians 2 5, whatever that is. If you if you just, you know, today you get an aha moment out of Ephesians 2 5, and it's like, whoa, it just rocks your world. Three weeks from now, you may read Ephesians 2 5 again, and all of a sudden, whoa! Something entirely different. Yeah. Because the word is alive. It'll feed you the bread that you need today. But Jesus said when he was praying the Lord's Prayer, my, uh, give us this day my daily bread. Yeah. That's the word I need for today. Yeah. That's my daily bread. Yeah. Uh, Hebrews 1 2. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him he made the world. Spoken to us by his son. And this is the word made flesh. Yeah. 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 I, I just felt like I had to clear one thing up. As, as someone new into this, um, I'm a little better on that same level. Um, my impression is, is that the spirit or the flesh 
is playing checkers and God is playing chess. Yes. And because God <laughs> yeah. has a greater elevation and can see tomorrow, the next day, and the day after. Right. So your flesh isn't going to understand what he's saying, but, you know. You the spirit know. does. The spirit does. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like that analogy. Oftentimes in the flesh realm, we're playing checkers and, and God's playing chess. That's exactly right. That's a good way to put that. And we just have to pursue him. Anybody else? I hope this has been beneficial tonight. I really kind of just want to go through some of this very uh, kind of down-to-earth how-to stuff. Yes, ma'am. So on that hard exposure, what if, per se, your husband plays golf and he says to you, babe, if you start playing golf, I'm finding another sport. Then what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I did say that. There's, hey, would y'all not all agree that there's some things that guys want to do by themselves? And they want to do by themselves? There is a few things. And I was kidding. I was kidding. But I did say, she said she might want to go up and start playing golf sometime. And I said, that's, that's be great. I'll find me something else to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got you. I got you. So what you do is just... Then you just invite him to go dress shopping or shoe shopping. There you go. I just don't see myself duck hunting or golfing. Like, it's just not working out. Just not. Right. You'll have to hunt other common heart desires. There you go. Yeah, you'll have to hunt other common heart desires. That's right. Brother Charles. I, I had uh, something happen to me. Uh, you, we were talking about other mm -hmm. And you touched on the, this thing that happened to me almost every uh, different subjects that we talked about. So it seems to be important to me to tell the story that happened to me in Amarillo, Texas. And the story starts out, I was in the play. And uh, I had just finished uh, the, my team, and I had just finished the uh, shutdown, and, and took some days off from it, and we had done a very good job. And I had to, with all of this, I had a pocket full of money, and I was uh, took the day off, and I was just uh, I didn't know what it was going to be. But I drove downtown, and there was a hop shop down there, or whatever coffee shop. And so I pulled up the truck right in front of it, and I got out, and I spent about an hour in that in that shop, and I looked at everything they had, and there was nothing in there that I wanted or it was almost revolting to me to yeah. be in there. And, uh, but I had terrible anxiety. Right. I, I knew there was something that was going something on right. and I couldn't find it. So I left the, 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 the pawn shop and I walked a half a block down in main part of Amarillo and I turned the corner to the right it seems like I was being carried there practically. And there was a, a Greyhound bus stop just about almost to the other end of the block across the street. So I walked there and I walked in the door and this young lady uh, couldn't have been very old, but she did have two children. So she was, you know, and she walked, run, almost ran up to me and she said, I, I'm in trouble and I need some help. And uh, I said, well, I, I, you know, I'll be glad to listen to what, you know. And she said, well, we've out of money. I'm trying to get to my husband. And I, I don't remember where, but it was a long way from there. And I don't have any uh, food for my children. I don't have enough money. There was a plate in the, in the shop. And I said, well, you know, first of all, let's, let's eat, you know. So we sat down and they ordered, and I was... <clears throat> I tell us without being touched about it. Because it was many years ago, probably 20 or 30 maybe. Oh, we had one. So anyway, we had dinner, or had a, a lunch. And I gave her some money, and she, and I, and I was crying at, at, the at the booth that we were in at that time. I was just so tore up uh, within my soul, or within my heart. And I realized at that moment the Lord had sent me. Yeah. On that. And I was so happy to be able to do God's work. Yeah. Uh, 
And so ever after that, I was praying, Lord, send me on another one of those. <laughs> send me on another mission. Yeah, another mission. And he has, uh, although it's been a while since he has, yeah. but uh, it, 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 I've had very many of those. And that yeah. was... And that's a perfect example of your peace. When you were in the pawn shop, your peace had left. You didn't have any peace while you were in there. But when you walked into the Greyhound bus shop, the peace was there. Well, when I walked out of the shop, it started. I was being directed. I, I, yeah. I more so know that now than I did probably at the time. Right. But it, it was, yeah. Yeah, was that's fun. just a prime example of, a, of, of one place where you're, the lack of peace was speaking to you as loudly as the peace did in the other place. Yeah. yeah. Well, I appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, God bless each and every one of you. I hope you're learning from this study. If we're going to be a spiritually minded people led by the Spirit, we need to learn to be do, do so in maturity. There's a, perfect, there's a wonderful uh, Spirit that the Lord has given us to lead us, guide us, and direct us. We just need to be grown up in the Spirit realm enough to hear His voice allow him to lead us in maturity and follow him. If we do that, the Bible says he will guide us into all truths. That's right. That's our goal. Father, I thank you for this wonderful people. I thank you, Father, that they have come out on a Wednesday night to hear your word. Father, I pray that tonight what has happened is iron has sharpened iron. And as we have come together, they have sharpened me and I have sharpened them. And Father, we all leave this place sharper than we were when we got here. That we will be able to go out and be very productive soldiers for you. That we'll be able to go out into this lost and dying and dark world, Father, and be a light that will bring in those thousand souls. And Father, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for being here tonight. Choir practice at 6. Jamie.